This is Thursday, October 30th, 2014. We are at the Museum of World War II Boston, and this tape is part of the ongoing Veterans Oral History Project based at the Morris Institute Library in partnership with Natick Pegasus in Natick, Massachusetts. My name is Maureen Sullivan. We are privileged to have with us today Derek E. Till. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? Uh, 25th of November, 1922. And where were you born? In the south of England, in a small country town called Eastleigh. And what community do you currently live? In Bedford, Massachusetts, in a retirement community there. Marital status? Married. Do you have children? Yes. And how many? Oh, I have three, and, and I have three stepchildren. Grandchildren? Oh, between us, we have seven. Any great-grandchildren? No. <laughs> Tell us a bit about living in the south of England when you were growing up. Well, it was a relatively small town. It was oriented towards the railway because the railway moved their workshops down from London. Um, both my grandfathers worked in the shops, and uh, my father eventually became a, a butcher. We had a nice little house on the outskirts of, of, of the village, uh, looking over green fields. And then, uh, instead of working for a, a large store, he bought a business and we moved up to a place called Woking, which was just west of, of, of London. And I understand your father served in World War I. Oh yes, he was... Uh, he. He did some, some uh, training as a teenager for two years, and then as soon as war broke out, the very day war broke out in August 1914, he was called back into the uh, military, served as a, a, a so-called driver. That meant he, he led a, a team of six horses, and he was in the Battle of Mons and, and uh, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Did he ever talk about his experiences? Not very much. He was a bit reluctant to talk about them. And what kind of schools did you attend? Oh, just well, public schools and until I was lucky enough to get a, uh, a, a scholarship to what was called a grammar school, which gave me uh, enough education so that I could apply for, for university, although that was not likely to happen in those days. But it was useful after the war in my getting into the English equivalent of the GI Bill. While you were attending school, were you made aware of events in Germany especially? Well, yes, I think from about, uh, certainly from 1938 on, I was well aware of what was happening. Mm -hmm. Where um, we're going to go now to September 1st, 1939, the day Germany invaded Poland. Do you remember that day? Oh, very clearly. I was working in, uh, in uh, London as a clerk in the civil service in, in an office in a building in Whitehall, quite close to the Houses of Parliament. And, um, well, it was uh, September the 3rd, I think, that the actual declaration of war was made by, by uh, our government, and uh, we didn't know what to expect at that particular point. But I, I remember after the declaration, the air raid sirens went off immediately, <laughs> and uh, we wondered why. It, it, it was, yeah. uh, were you immediately inducted into the army? Did you volunteer for service? Well, I wasn't old enough at that point to uh, to either be inducted or to volunteer, but <clears throat> as soon as I was uh, 18, I uh, asked to be released from my civil service profession, but, but they held me up because I was working in a civil defense uh, kind of operation. But after a while, they did let me apply, and so I volunteered for air crew and uh, was... Uh, um, uh, I pass the necessary physical and, and uh, other exams. It was a two-day uh, process, and uh, that was in, uh, I think, July of, of 1941. 
So you were in the London area during the Blitz. I was, yes. And tell us more about that. Well, right after 1939, there was what was called the Phony War. Nothing seemed to be happening. Then, of course, there was the Battle of Britain, in which naturally, as a young guy, I was very interested in what was going on. Uh, but then when Hitler failed to uh, get his bombers through because of the uh, Spitfires, etc., etc., Battle of Britain stuff, uh, then he started to bomb London by night. And uh, at that time, the office that I was in called for volunteers to man a, a rooftop post looking for incendiary buildings. And uh, so instead of, of commuting up to London all the time, I spent three nights a week uh, on shifts up in this uh, shelter from which you had a splendid view of what was going on, some of which you didn't really want to see. But uh, uh, it, when they were b bombing the docks uh, quite heavily and the, and the city of London, the, we could see the fires and so on from, from our rooftop post. It was. It was scary, of course, but uh, also th there was a certain exhilaration about it uh, that I must admit. Aside from being on a rooftop post, did you have any other duties? Uh, were you, uh, did you ever attend to the wounded? Did you drive a car? Oh, no. Yeah. No, I, I was strictly a, mm -hmm. uh, what was called a fire watcher. Any stories from the time you were a fire watcher? Sorry? Were there any stories, or you, anything you remember about when you were a fire watcher? Oh, about the Blitz? And, yes. Well, of course, the, the, the challenge was uh, commuting back and forth because you never knew whether the, the railroads would be running or the buses would be running. And it, was, it, 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 it you used to take a long time to, uh, to get... Um, to get home sometimes by very circuitous routes. Um, I remember one occasion that sticks in my memory. I was waiting on Waterloo Station in the late evening for the, a train, and uh, there was an air raid on, but it was not not much was happening. But Waterloo Station is a huge cavern, with a, and uh, uh, I was sitting just waiting and, and, and a, a man came in, well he was obviously a, uh, of a Scottish regiment and he had his pipes and he was also waiting for a train. He pulled out his pipes and he started walking slowly back and forth in the concourse playing the bagpipes and it was the most eerie you know, sound. It's the kind of situation where the hairs on the back of your neck stood up, you know, it was, it was just amazing. Because of the vast air space, the background of some distant uh, guns and so on, very moving. And how long were you a fire watcher? Well, until uh, I went into the uh, RAF. And when was that? Well, that was... Um, uh, I didn't go in immediately after I uh, got a number, which was, uh, I think, in, in, as I said, in, uh, in July 1941. Uh, there was a queue for training. You know, there were more people had volunteered than they had uh, room for. And so it was, was um, um, much later that year that I actually uh, put on a uniform and, uh, and started the uh, training process. Now, why the RAF? Well, I think that, in, in all honesty, uh, the uh, excitement appealed to me more than the drudgery of the army and the, and the open ocean. I, I, th I thought, thought it, there was a certain rom romanticism about it, I suppose, at the age of 18. All right, so now you're in the RAF. Uh, tell us a bit about basic, your first days in the force? Well, um, I started off in a bunch of flats in London where we got our uniforms and uh, general preparation work and then uh, we, we were sent by train a, a unit called a flight of 60 of us 
down to what was a sort of a basic training camp uh, on the coast in a town called called uh, Torquay in southern southwestern England. We got there. We were paraded on the station uh, car park. <coughs> the uh, a, a very uh, stern-looking uh, senior non-commissioned officer came out and addressed us. Now I'll never forget that. He said, uh, now you think you are the cream of the crop because you are air crew under training. He said, but as far as I'm concerned, you're a shower of shit. Hmm. Now, that was our indoctrination to the training. We were there for, I don't know, a couple of months. Uh, getting very physically fit and getting some learning about uh, navigation, meteorology, uh, the, the workings of an airplane and so on. And then uh, we were sent to a, to a different uh, uh, site where we were given 12 hours training in the de Havilland Tiger Moth, a twin engine, excuse me, a twin wing uh, uh, little um, trainer plane. The idea was to, to eliminate anybody who wasn't considered to be uh, good uh, um, fodder for, uh, for pilots. And uh, I passed that uh, test satisfactorily and some time afterwards was on a, <coughs> excuse me, on a, uh, on a boat uh, to Canada where before the war they, they instigated a, a cooperative scheme with Canada to set up a number of uh, aerodromes for training purposes, which of course in the, in the prairies with a lot of flat land, it was not difficult to do. So after we, l we landed in New York uh, and uh, discovered from, from local papers and people who told us that apparently the ship we were on had been sunk in mid-Atlantic, although we didn't notice anything at the time. Uh, we were then put on a train because uh, they wouldn't allow us to off the boat into into New York. They'd never get us back again. So, uh, so anyway, the, the train went um, the northern route um, to uh, to Boston and came into what I now recognize was North Station, where we got another train that took us up to the to uh, Moncton, Nova Scotia. And this was in the winter by then, and the, the sight of so much snow was very exciting to us because in England you, you, there wasn't very much snow, and if there was, it didn't last very long. But so I think the local people thought we were fools because we'd love to get out and slosh around in snow that was almost up to your, up to your waist. Had a, 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 oh, a waiting time there, and then we, again we put on a, a train and eventually wound up at a place called Calgary in, in Alberta. And from there took a little train north to a small town called Penhold where there was a primary training facility. Again with these little uh, 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 biplane tiger moths. So here you are about 19. 19 yes. years old, and yes. you're, you're in the middle of Canada. Did you ever think you were going to be in the middle of Canada? <laughs> no, no. Actually, it was Western Canada. We could mm -hmm. see the Rockies from our, from our plane. That was, that was, it was quite uh, interesting. Okay, so tell us a bit more about training in Canada. Well, the, the, the Tiger Moth is a delightful little uh, trainer. And it's very sensitive on the controls, which makes it uh, a good trainer. Um, but a bit, you have, have to really concentrate when you fly it. You, you could operate the controls the column with a finger and thumb. It was so light. And so we uh, had dual instruction, of course. And eventually, the big day when you went solo and did a few circuits around, and um, from after that, uh, you were given various exercises and, and um, aerobatics of various types. I frankly hated doing aerobatics. And, uh, and so <coughs> after this uh, uh, primary training, when we were divided into those who were going on to, 
single engine, like fighter type training or multi engine. I was pleased to be in the multi engine category. We went just a few miles to another aerodrome where there were these uh, twin engined uh, monoplane trainers, the Airspeed Oxford, which is a very nice little aeroplane. And uh, it, was, uh, it was fun to fly. Uh, the, uh, some of the exercises of flying were really very nice, especially uh, if you were allowed to go low flying and uh, you skim across the, uh, the surface of the, <laughs> of the earth, uh, doing rather dangerous things, uh, I'm afraid. But um, you, you didn't get uh, much of an opportunity to do that. You, it's mostly with an instructor when you did that sort of thing. Uh, but um, I graduated uh, in June the following year. Would that be 1942? That would have been 42, I guess, yes. Okay. Yeah. And tell us what happened next. Well, um, I had a, um, some some... I guess I had some, some characteristics which seemed to make me suited for uh, multi-engine flying. And, and um, instead of sending me back to England, I went to, to um, further training for what was called Coastal Command. And that was the part of the RAF who had the res responsibility for um, uh, protection of convoys and anti-submarine duties and that sort of thing. And in order to do the really long-range patrols with planes that were up for maybe 20 hours, <coughs> they used to fly them with three pilots, one flying, one navigating, and one asleep. And so I was given uh, training as a navigator to add to my, my pilot training and uh, over the Gulf of St. Lawrence and the Cape Breton and uh, the south of Newfoundland and so on. It was, it was a, kind of a holiday after the other kind of uh, flying. Uh, but uh, then at the end of that time, I was transferred to uh, what was called an operational training unit where we flew quite heavy, uh, actually with the, the uh, uh, Lockheed Hudson. And this was uh, equipped with a couple of depth charges and uh, machine guns and so on. It was a very b nicely done adaptation of a Lockheed uh, pre-war airline, uh, airliner, I mean. And, uh, and so after some basic tr uh, training in that, um, I went out to do some convoy escorts uh, uh, off of the south of, uh, of Newfoundland mostly. and. Uh, You'd find a convoy, and the, the commodore would tell you to fly out in a certain direction and look for U-boats and so on. And it was boring flying, but uh, it was uh, the convoys loved to have us around. Did you ever spot any U-boats? No. So how long were you uh, being a convoy for escorts, or I'm sorry, escort for convoys? <laughs> Oh, I, I only did uh, actually two uh, what were called operations. There were a number of training flights, but the two operations meant you went out with live depth charges and so on and so forth. Uh, but then I got transferred to Bomber Command, and I gather there was a shortage of pilots at that time. And so that's when I was uh, given a couple of weeks' leave and uh, met my future wife in New York City. and. Uh, went back uh, on a troop ship from Halifax, Nova Scotia. During the time you were in Canada, did you have a chance to correspond with your family back in England? Oh yes, yes, we had these uh, little airmail uh, letters that uh, mm -hmm. were um, <coughs> supplied by the, the government and were censored before they left. And, but, uh, that, would that been like uh, V mail? V mail? Uh, v mail. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. I, I guess that would mm -hmm. probably be called. Yeah. And um, how about your social life? Uh, did you have a chance to 
get out on the town? Or did you have a chance to? Well, it varied a great deal. And sometimes there was very little of it. Uh, uh, but um, uh, in, in, in Canada, when we did have a weekend off occasionally, there were families in, in, in the local towns who invited us in and made us welcome and put us up overnight and, and showed us the local sites and so on. And, and that was very interesting and, and very warming. And uh, there, were, there was a big Scotch population in that general part of the, of the country and uh, they seemed to almost compete to have the people with them. And did you keep up on the news of the war in Europe and Asia? Well, there wasn't any war in Asia. Well, there was that, that, yeah. Uh, I, I guess um, we didn't know very much about what was going on in the Pacific except for Pearl Harbor and that sort of thing. Uh, and English news came through the, uh, the broadcast via the, the, the Canadian Broadcasting reporting from the British broadcasting. So we, we, we were fairly up to date, I think, yeah. So now you're in Bomber Command. Tell us what happened next. More training. More training. Of course. I mean, England was completely blacked out then. You know, there were all the aerodrome lights were very, very small. And uh, it was necessary to do a, a lot more instrument flying and uh, some of that was training on the ground in, in uh, what was called the link trainer, which was a, like an aircraft cockpit that, that uh, had an instrument panel, and, and you sat in there in the dark for hours while, the, and, you, and you, you, know, you were asked to fly different courses and do different things. And they even had a way to put rough air onto you so that you had to control it as if you had a lot of turbulence, and some people actually got sick inside these things. <laughs> uh, so, um, but there was a, 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 I had to, to, to sort of retrain onto Bomber Command aircraft. The, the most interesting one was the, <coughs> the Vickers Wellington, which was a pre-war uh, a, a, a bomber that was designed by Barnes Wallace. The, he was famed later on for his bouncing bomb for the dams and his huge uh, blockbuster bombs. Uh, but um, the uh, Wellington was was a, a fine aircraft. Uh, it had some peculiarities, but uh, uh, they weren't di too difficult to take care of. But the thing was that you'd be sent up for maybe five hours to do uh, sort of long cr uh, cross-country flights at night uh, over England and Scotland and the North Sea and so on, uh, just to get you familiar with what it was like to, to, to fly uh, at night uh, in cloud or in storms or whatever. And I should point out that uh, all English uh, aircraft of Bomber Command only flew with one pilot. It was very important that, that uh, the, the availability of pilots would sort of match the availability of airplanes. And uh, that meant that uh, the, the, it was important that the planes that you flew were, were fairly uh, uh, comfortable and uh, friendly to you, as it were. Uh, the uh, Wellington wasn't too bad in that respect, but um, it was tiring for, because there was no automatic pilot worth a damn, you know. it was. Uh, uh, I don't think the Wellington even had one. The the Lancaster had one, but it wasn't very good. So after I was, I suppose, uh, several months on the on the Wellington, uh, <coughs> uh, then it was the time to transfer to the to the four-engined uh, heavy aircraft. The ones that were used for training were the, was the handy page Halifax, which was a, a good bomber, but not as good as the Lancaster. And so the Halifax was used for training. It had four Merlin engines, the same as the Lancaster. And uh, um, it, it was uh, uh, not a difficult aircraft to fly, except on my, uh, my first takeoff 
for a solo at night. And I just had a uh, uh, fl flight engineer with me. And uh, as we got halfway down the runway and we were practically airborne, I realized that my flying instrument panel uh, that, that um, gives you your, your speed, your altitude, and other important knowledge uh, was not working. And here I was with this four-engine plane, and uh, so I, uh, I told the, the control tower what was going on, and they said, well, that will clear the circuit of any other planes. Just take your time. And, and so uh, uh, then, with the aid of the flight engineer, and it was quite quite a, a dark night, and there were, of course there were no lights on the ground to give you a feeling of height or where you were, but with the aid of the flight engineer, who uh, could sort of calculate the speed we were doing from the what was called the boost and uh, other aircraft instruments, and so we made a very slow circuit and made a very long approach, and fortunately there was a very long runway, so we didn't run off the end of it. But that was, that was kind of exciting. I might have added, by the way, earlier on that my first night solo on the Lockheed Hudson in, in the earlier training for Coastal Command, I got airborne from this place called Moncton and they said, oh, uh, look, the fog has rolled in, uh, you can't lo uh, land. Uh, so I had to detour to, uh, to Prince Edward Island, which was uh, Oh, I don't know, a hundred miles away, I think. <laughs> so first night solos were not popular with me. Uh, do you want me to continue with the... Go right ahead. Okay, the, the, uh, uh, the final piece of training before joining a squadron was, uh, was 10 hours on what was called a Lancaster finishing school. And... Uh, the Lancaster was a delight to fly. It was light on the controls, beautifully balanced. And, uh, well, by this time I had acquired a crew of uh, two gunners, a flight engineer, wireless operator, <coughs> a bomb aimer, and a navigator. And, uh, and so we were, we were ready to go. And um, we complete, completed our, our training uh, one morning, in the afternoon, we were put in a truck and, and sent to a squadron. And that same night, I flew, uh, not, not as a pilot, but uh, accompanying uh, a crew to get acclimatized to what was going on. So they didn't waste any time to get us into uh, action, as it were. Now, you're now in a Lancaster. Right. And you have a crew. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with British aircraft as opposed to American craft, how big was the Lancaster? The Lancaster was at a wingspan, I think, of 99 feet. It's about the same size as a B-17. Mm -hmm. the, the distinguishing factor, as we always like to say, was that the, we carried about uh, uh, almost three t t times the, uh, the bomb tonnage that the B-17 carried. But then the B-17 had a lot of, of turrets, uh, machine guns, and so on, and was designed to protect uh, against uh, enemy fighters. Uh, the, uh, the Lancaster did have uh, uh, gunners and machine guns, but they were, uh, we, had a, we had a crew of seven, whereas I think the B-17 had a crew of 11. And uh, the... Uh, uh, the crew was, was kept pretty busy. What time now are we talking about? Are we talking 1943 still, or uh, when you were just about to start your missions? Oh, this was, uh, this was I think, in the, it must have been the middle of 1944, by, by the time I'd had this extra year's training and so on. Would this have been around the time of the Normandy invasion or afterward? It was uh, just about, I think just, I started just before the Normandy invasion. <clears throat> so 
So tell us about your first mission. Well, um, first mission was, was fairly straightforward. Uh, and we were sent to support the invasion forces by, by bombing um, some defenses on one of the uh, <clears throat> estuaries leading into the uh, channel ports, uh, the uh, French ports, I mean, yeah. And that was uneventful and I was very happy about that. You got your, to complete your mission? Uh, on that first mission, did you have any enemy fire drawn at you? Well, uh, I did 37 missions and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so, some of them were boring and some of them were, was, were more exciting than I really wanted. But uh, well, The first mission was? It was pretty straightforward, yeah. Okay. But the average uh, mission time for me was, was six and a half hours. <clears throat> and the longest was was uh, over nine hours, and uh, that was to a, a town called Jem uh, Chemnitz, which was uh, <clears throat> on the eastern frontier, bet between where where uh, the Russian troops were approaching and uh, the Germans were fighting back. And uh, at that time, uh, Stalin asked for. <clears throat> the RAF to bomb towns so that he thought would impede his approach, and so uh, it was a that was a long and uh, and uh, tiring, shall we say, that one. Tell us a little more about preparing for the mission. Oh well, <clears throat> uh, after what was called the Ops Meal. They gave us a good meal to start off with because the, the, the food, even in the, uh, the officer's mess in those days, but it wasn't that great, you know. And so uh, <clears throat> after that, we'd go to the, um, to the, to the briefing room. And, uh, uh, well, the, you probably may have seen on, in movies uh, pictures of of a sort of a smoke-filled room with bunches of crew people sitting around uh, chatting and laughing and smoking up a storm. <clears throat> and then the flight commander of the base comes in and everybody leaps to attention, etc. Well, actually, it was just like that. And uh, uh, we sat at a bench as a crew and listened to the various... Uh, <clears throat> uh, briefing activities that were going on, um, ranging from the meteor meteorology of what the weather was going to be like. Um, we liked it when it was cloudy and no moon. And uh, then the, they would tell us, uh, uh, they would reveal the target for tonight, and uh, they'd draw back a curtain, and there on a big map would be a, a red ribbon that went... Uh, uh, to the target, although of course it never went directly to the target. There were feints and different ways to get around defenses and so on. And there might be a groan if it was one of those targets that you didn't really want to go to. Uh, but um, the, uh, uh, the intelligence officers would try to tell you something about the... Uh, <coughs> the uh, what, what you could expect from the defenses and so on. Can I take a little break here? And, Go right uh, ahead. I remember one uh, interesting uh, briefing when the, um, the intelligence officer said, look, uh, uh, and I think this was a d one of the few daylight raids I did, but uh, he said, you know, you, you'll see something probably that we call scarecrows. And they're things which the Germans shoot up from a big uh, gun or a mortar or something, and they explode and they look like a, a bomber blowing up. They said, yeah, well, you'll, you'll see a lot of black smoke and, and colored lights and stuff like that. He said, we'd like to know where you see those because it gives us a clue as to what's going on on the ground. But, you know, ignore them. They're, they're just to make you feel uncomfortable. Well, we learned after the war there were no such things as scarecrows. 
That was, they were actually bombs blowing up. <laughs> but the intelligence people didn't want us to know that. A little misdirection. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Uh, but um, one of the, uh, uh, the, the things which Bomber Command uh, gradually uh, evolved into some good tactics under the leadership of uh, Air Marshal uh, Harris, who uh, uh, was a very good man, uh, was to, to concentrate the bombers over the target so that you get the maximum number of, of planes in the shortest possible time. And uh, also to fly uh, uh, as close together as possible on the route to and from the target. Now you now couldn't see the other planes at night, of course, uh, but the navigators were all extremely well trained. And each navigator was given a time and an altitude for the plane to be over the target to the nearest half minute and to the nearest uh, 500 feet. And so uh, <coughs> there'd be a turning point which might be quite sharp, uh, but uh, you couldn't see anything around you. But there were planes that, were, if they turned early, would be crossing your path one way. And if you were, were a bit late, you'd be crossing the, their path. And so th th there were collisions at these turns. But um, uh, we had a, a very close one, but fortunately, uh, no problem. And then um, as we, you get closer to the target, you could, you could see by then that the so-called pathfinders who went ahead of the main force, they were also flying in Lancasters, and they also did some bombing. But they were, were experienced crews, and they marked the target area with these colored uh, little incendiary things, like sort of uh, long, long uh, burning fireworks. They were yellow or green or red or uh, whatever. And then <coughs> there was a man called the, the Master Bomber, who was a very experienced uh, guy who would fly around at quite a low level, and, he, and on a special radio frequency, he would address the main force as it came in and say, uh, uh, overshoot the green flares by two seconds or something of that sort, and give, each, give the bomb aimers a, an opportunity to be corrected by his visual indication of where he wanted the bombs to be dropped because after a while he didn't want them all to go in the same place. He wanted them spread out more. But the other, over the target, of course, all of a sudden there was a lot of light from fires, from searchlights and, and so on, and you're suddenly conscious of all these planes around you because we might get two or three hundred aircraft over the target in about 20 minutes. And uh, there were times when the navigate the bomb aimer would be ta giving me uh, instructions as to as to how to steer the plane, but then the mid upper gunner who had a splendid view upwards would say, "Skipper, there's a guy above us with his bomb doors open. Get out of here!" <laughs> and there were certainly a number of casualties from what you might call friendly bombs. Uh, in fact, I lost a very good friend that way, and uh, that was one of the hazardous the aspects of, of flying that you had, hadn't really considered. And on the way uh, out from the target, um, uh, you still had to be very aware uh, that the night fighters and so on would, uh, would close in on you. So that was, um, you had to be pretty vigilant until you get out over the North Sea somewhere and the coffee and sandwiches would be broken out at that point. You've mentioned earlier, uh, of course, the, the collisions, the near collisions, sometimes casualties from friendly bombers. Let's talk about a couple of missions where you were encountering not so friendly bombers. Oh, well, uh, <clears throat> there's one uh, mission that sticks in my mind. <clears throat> and we ha we're going in, I think it was a town called Zeiss. Anyway, it was a fairly deep penetration. And the, uh, the, the route had been 
designed so that we would appear to be going one to one town and then we'd go to some other town and finally we'd wind up there. So it was a circuitous route. And at one point, uh, each pilot, by the way, had its own little map that, that had on in the basic route and the heights and so on. And uh, it seemed to me that we were at or had passed a, a turning point. So I called up the navigator and I said, Charlie, uh, shouldn't we be turning towards the target uh, now? And he said, oh, no, don't worry, Skipper. He said, uh, you know, um, you may be sure I know where we are. I'll give you a, uh, the term when it's appropriate. And I waited another few minutes and I said, well, Charlie, surely we should have turned. He said, don't worry, Skip, I'm experienced. I know what I'm doing. Well, I was just about to call him again when the wireless operator called out and said, Charlie's passed out. And apparently his oxygen mask had become disconnected because we all had oxygen at 20,000 feet. <clears throat> None of these aircraft were pressurized. And so um, Charlie was plugged back in, into his oxygen and came to pretty quickly. And he gave me a new course to steer. Well, it wasn't long before we could see the fires in the target anyway. But it was very, very lonely because I was, must have been the last plane to bomb by far. And shortly afterwards, we were, uh, we were coned by searchlights and uh, <coughs> we shook them off with some difficulty. We'd, we were attacked by a fighter, but he never got his uh, guns on us. And, and so we were, we were kind of uh, lucky in that respect. We got back yeah, safe and sound. But we did have one or two other scares. Uh, one t time I had a uh, flak uh, uh, broke one side of the windshield and, and uh, it was very cold for a while. And, uh, but uh, fortunately, uh, uh, the, the, the only uh, uh, injury that we had for our, our whole missions was the front gunner um, who was also the, the bomb aimer, um, got, um, uh, his turret was hit and uh, he got uh, a piece of uh, shrapnel in his, in his uh, arm. Um, I had, a piece of the windshield went by me when I was on handing the control column and I, I have a little scar here, that's my big war wound. It's at least half an inch long. <laughs> so, you know, one of the lucky ones. Very lucky ones. Yeah. So, um, where was your base in England? In, uh, in uh, Lincolnshire. We were about five miles from the town of Lincoln. Uh, <coughs> what was your rank at the time? Sorry? Your rank? Uh, were you a lieutenant, captain? Oh, I was a flight lieutenant flight at lieutenant. that time, yeah. And how long were you um, stationed with this particular squadron? Uh, were you there for the rest of 1944 into 1945? Oh yes, I was. Um, I was was posted out to uh, India, um, or just before the, the war in Europe uh, uh, came to an end. And so I missed all the victory things that went on there. I was very annoyed about that uh, but um, the, uh, the the thing was that um, I, I was on leave after completing my missions but was call, called back uh, before my leave was over to get on the troop ship so I, I um, didn't get together with my crew again and that, that was really quite upsetting because they were a bunch of guys that I enjoyed very much. There were uh, three officers and four sergeants. And uh, so because the officers and sergeants, of course, didn't share the same mess, we, we, we um, would uh, socialize by, by um, <coughs> getting in my a very old car that I'd bought, that I could fly an airplane before I could drive a car, by the way. And anyway, 
Um, we, we pile all seven of us into this battered vehicle and, and drive the five miles into Lincoln. And of course, um, naturally, uh, everybody had to buy everybody else a beer. So I think driving home was probably the most dangerous part of my whole uh, RAF career. But uh, anyway, I, I uh, was able to keep uh, track of, of, of one of them. Um, and uh, we did exchange change letters for a while. Uh, but then, uh, as I say, the, the, um, the reason for, for me being sent out to India was there's going to be uh, a force of, of uh, RAF Lancasters, several hundred, was to be staged through India and to Okinawa and to bomb Japan by night. And I was to be a sort of test pilot at uh, at a big station in, in India where, where they were going to be uh, tropicalized and slightly modified, to it, and then uh, they'd be taken on. But of course, the atom bomb put all that uh, to shame. So nothing happened there. Yeah. Okay, so you're in Europe, and were you you were ordered to India, or did you volunteer for India? Oh no, that was all part of it. I, I, yeah, very much so. <laughs> and what was India like? Well, um, parts of it I found very enjoyable, parts of it I found rather depressing. Uh, Calcutta, where I wound up being based, was a, was a, a city where I f felt there were so many poor people sleeping in the streets. Um, it was... Um, uh, an uncomfortable feeling being there, to, to tell you the truth. Not that uncomfortable from the standpoint of, of um, your, your own, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you weren't scared, I don't mean that way. I, what I mean is it was uncomfortable because of seeing all this poverty and, and um, you know, we were doing, you know, pretty well. Uh, but, um, uh, I had, um, an interesting experience there, and I was uh, hospitalized with some unknown, uh, never really diagnosed uh, in internal <laughs> problem. And after about six weeks in a hospital in Calcutta, they sent me off to a, a hill station to Darjeeling to, to recuperate. And that proved to be uh, a very interesting. The, uh, well, first of all, getting there, there was this little r railroad. It was only about uh, two feet wide and, and had, a, had a Red Cross train that, that went up uh, very steeply in, into the, the hills there. Remarkable piece of uh, railway engineering. Anyway, uh, but the people in, in that part of, uh, of India were quite different, and they were very um, friendly and, uh, and seemed to be, you know, well-fed and so on. So I had a very pleasant month up in Darjeeling, and th uh, that was at the time that the, uh, that the atom bomb was dropped, and, and uh, it was a great big celebration, of course. The, 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 uh, there was a lot of tea planters around Darjeeling, as you might imagine, and they had a club there, and we were invited to join them for celebration. By the time we got there, however, the only things left in the bar were, th were th like cordials, you know, crème de menthe and so on. Not a very good drink to celebrate. An awful hangover. Oh dear. While you were in training in India, of course, you've been spending the last couple of years bombing Germans. Were you told anything, anything special about the Japanese? Oh well, we we'd heard about the uh, the kamikaze uh, uh, men, and uh, I think we had uh, a lot of respect for the Japanese pilots, who apparently were very good. And of course, it was a very big blow to England when two of their latest large capital ships, uh, uh, battleships, were were sunk by. Uh, Japanese uh, planes, uh, well, when uh, they uh, occupied uh, uh, Singapore, and that was a real blow.
So in August 1945, you're stationed in India, and you hear about this thing called an atomic bomb. Yeah. What do you think about that? I thought it was, uh, we could scarcely believe it to start with, uh, but then, uh, so, you know, news filtered through, and uh, it really was amazing, and every was sort of a huge collective sigh of relief, uh, and uh, we began, began to think about um, getting back to, to England. But uh, the unit that I was po posted to when I came out of the hospital moved uh, down to Rangoon, so I spent uh, almost a year in Rangoon before I was actually demobilized. And that proved to be very interesting, actually. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the Burmese people were very fun-loving. They, they'd had lots of uh, festivals. And I remember walking down the street and somebody from an upstairs window poured a bucket of water over me. That was the water festival. I was supposed to enjoy it, you know. <laughs> but uh, no, I made some good friends there, and uh, it was a, a, the uh, the town was uh, was interesting. So, what were your duties when you were stationed in Burma? Well, uh, there were small RAF detachments that were in places like uh, Singapore and Hong Kong and Bangkok and uh, and uh, in Indo Indochina. And the unit that I was on used to fly in spare parts for them and for various other engineering needs. Uh, uh, we used both at that time flying these uh, DC-3s or uh, C-47s, the Douglas Dakota as they were called. Very good transport plane, very nice viceless plane, a good old gentleman's uh, plane to fly. Uh, and uh, actually one of the first things I got involved in was flying over to Bangkok to bring back uh, prisoners of war who had been working on that Burma Siam Railway, you know, the, the, the Bridge on the River Kwai mm -hmm. uh, movie thing. Mm -hmm. They were so emaciated we could carry a lot more of them than we could our regular passengers. And uh, they were put in hospitals in various towns in, in India to, to recover. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction when you first saw them? Well, uh, it, 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 it was a little horrific that people could be so emaciated, you know. And uh, but they were so glad to see us, and uh, and uh, it was not an unhappy event at all. All right. So now you're in Burma. It's now 1946. Are you still a flight lieutenant at this point? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, time for demobilization. Did you get your notice by mail, by phone? Well, no, it came through on what, um, the general orders. And uh, the unit that I was on then, I was actually commanding officer of it for a very short time, but it was being wound up completely. But I was given the, the, a choice. Uh, my navigator then, we only, uh, we only had a navigator as crew in the, in the DC-3s, uh, we both had the choice of, of flying a light plane back to Germany to be written off uh, the uh, least Lynn, uh, you know, the, to be written off essentially the English debt to, to America or to go by troop ship. Well, naturally, we thought flying a, a small uh, aircraft, a small twin-engine plane, uh, which was a, really a communications plane used by commanding officers and so on. And uh, so we actually, I think, we held the, war, the uh, world's record for the longest time it, to, to get from, uh, from Rangoon to, uh, to Munich because we managed to find co cooperative uh, uh, ground staff on the way who would tell us that we couldn't go on until some part had been replaced. <laughs> and so we spent uh, quite a nice time in Cairo and uh, in Italy and in Paris. And <laughs> uh, we, we really uh, managed to uh, return quite uh, Quite well. You were glad you didn't take the troop ship. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're now in Munich. What happened next? 
Well, um, <coughs> we delivered the plane, which I understand was, was then destroyed because they didn't want it on the commercial market. <laughs> and uh, and uh, went to, uh, to, to Nuremberg, which is where the RAF gathered people to, to be transported back to England. I happened to be there at the time of the, when the Nuremberg trials were on. And uh, I, we were billeted in a, in a, 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 sh a Schloss, I guess it was called, the Schloss Faber, the Pencil King, with, uh, it turned out, with the foreign correspondents for, for major, major newspapers all over the world. So it was a lovely bunch of people we were, we were stationed with. And that, that was uh, interesting and fun. But uh, a couple of weeks after that, then back we came to... Uh, did you get England. to attend the actual trials, or did you get it firsthand oh, from no, the, no, you know, no. the foreign correspondents? No, we would drink with them around the bar, and then mm -hmm. they'd all disappear about 9 o'clock and write their, <laughs> <laughs> their news up for the day, you know. Back to England? After, after Nuremberg? Yeah, yeah, back to England. And... Uh, um, yeah, that was uh, late, I guess it was uh, late 1946, yeah. And what rank did you get out uh, when you were demobilized? I was a flight lieutenant. And what um, medals or commendations did you receive? Oh, well, I've got the Distinguished Flying Cross, which is the, the, the one I'd really treasure. The, the others were sort of campaign medals and so on. Uh, but, um, well, one of the uh, things which really rankled with us was the fact that Bomber Command got a black eye and uh, there was no campaign medal or anything similar to that given to... to uh, Bomber Command air crew, and it was because people started second guessing what was going on, and the, you know, bombing cities was, was was at one time it was deemed important, but then later on it was deemed to be not not a good thing to do. Well, of course, we didn't agree it was a good thing to do either, but some, something had to be done, and uh, the result was that um, particularly Dresden was uh, the the kind of the arch-typical uh, uh, reason for giving uh, Bomber Command a, a black eye. And uh, so Arthur Harris, who had done a superb job as far as I was concerned, in, in, the, uh, in the awards that were given to senior personnel after the war, the, the three comparable branches of the service all became Lord Tether or Lord, Lord what? And so Arthur only became Sir Arthur. He became a baronet. So he was snubbed, really, and it was a shame. And, uh, and so, well, can I tell you a little bit about the, the, the Baba Command Memorial? By thing? all means. Okay. Well, <coughs> um, there were about 120,000 uh, men volunteered for Bomber Command, and of those, uh, 55,500 and something or other were killed, which was the greatest attrition rate of any branch of any service in World War II, in the British services anyway, whether they were commandos or whatever. And uh, that, uh, that, that there was absolutely no recognition of that. There was no memorial to, that was comparable to, to the memorial that was put up for the Battle of Britain pilots. And this just drifted on and on and on and was complained about from time to time. And finally, a, a bunch of people, I think it was about uh, 50 years after the end of the war, got together and decided that enough was enough. Um, if the government's not going to do anything, then the, the private sector will. And uh, some people who had been leading uh, people in the RAF and, and were retired got involved. A, um, a, a, a guy 
who was a, 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 a rock star and the Bee Gees uh, um, fronted it too. And so they raised a, a quite a substantial sum of money and were able to persuade the government to, to or actually because the City of London, to give them a, a place in, in uh, Green Park, which is just off Piccadilly, uh, where a, a suitable memorial could be put up. Well, it, um, it turned out to be an absolutely wonderful memorial. And uh, it was dedicated, uh, and what, this was what made it important. The government didn't want to know about it. The RAF uh, participated in, in the, in the uh, ceremonies of dedicating it. But there were 21 royals there at the ceremony, and the Queen unveiled, unveiled the statue. Uh, the statue is a very fine picture of, uh, uh, of a bomber crew. Uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're a little bit more than life size. Uh, the detail is, a, is remarkable in their uniforms and so on. And it's in, a, in a, an enclosure which is. Uh, um, a very nice piece of architecture, <coughs> and the uh, their ceremony was quite remarkable. It included a, a Lanc the one remaining Lancaster in England flew over and dropped. Uh, we were told fifty thousand uh, red uh, poppy uh, petals over the uh, area of the of the, um, of the memorial. And uh, <coughs> I was fortunate among those to be invited. There was uh, 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 well, it, it, it was a, there was a huge crowd of people there, and uh, uh, I guess because of my wartime service, I was allotted a seat in a in a stand to to view the uh, unveiling and the subsequent uh, speeches and so on that went on. And uh, uh, I had to, uh, to show uh, a special entrance card because th this is where the royalty were and uh, therefore the security and so on. And there was a group captain who was st serving at that time who was one of those who was uh, escorting people to their seats. And he looked at my card and he said, Row 30? He said, I can do better than that. He said, do you sit there and wait? So I sat there and waited, he said, come on. I went down and he put me in, in a row, and, and my wife in a row, that was about five rows back from where the Queen was sitting. <laughs> that was a great surprise, and, and it was a very warming um, ex experience that finally, you know, there's some, con some conclusion to this thing. All the newspapers said, 67 years late, but never too late, you know. Indeed, that must have been quite a day. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get you back to uh, 1946. You're about to become a civilian again. <laughs> yes. And uh, what you do after you got mustered out? Well, I had to go back into the civil service because that was part of my contract with them. Uh, but then I, I got to, uh, the equivalent of the, of the GI Bill, which was a, not a very generous but a, a livable um, grant for four years of, of college. And, uh, and so I had, to, uh, <coughs> I had to officially resign from the civil service. And I said, well, look, why couldn't I just take leave of absence? I might want to come back. And they said, oh, no, you've got to resign. Well, after I got my degree, I had a long letter from the Civil Service Commission saying, we understand you have a degree in chemistry. Have you ever thought of joining the scientific civil service? <laughs> so it was a wonderful opportunity to write them a nasty letter. <laughs> So where did you get your degree in chemistry? Oh, in the University of London. And uh, uh, it was a good degree. And we, uh, I, uh, as I uh, may, uh, may have mentioned earlier, um, 
there were there were recruiters in in London from major chemical companies looking for for help, and uh, and so I was pretty sure of getting a, a job over here. England. Uh, my wife actually wanted to stay in England because uh, she loved the theatre and she loved the, the fact that we could walk to the Albert to uh, the Albert Hall and for a, a, a very small sum of money listen to a symphony concerts. But um, Britain was still quite heavily rationed in, even in uh, in 1951, uh, and uh, the prospects for in industry didn't look good to me. So I made the I've got an immigration visa, and, and here I am. And where did you settle in the United States? Where did you settle in where, the U.S.? Where? Yes. Well, my wife had good friends in, in, in Concord, and uh, we, we settled in Concord for 50 years, my first wife, that is. And uh, uh, I got an introduction to... Uh, took the president of Arthur D. Little and uh, had a very, very satisfying career there. And this would be Concord, Massachusetts. That's correct, yes. When you were in the United States, being a veteran, did you join any veterans' organizations? No, no. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> the only one I joined was the, what, the British Officers Club of New England, which is n not a national <laughs> or recognized veterans organization. Uh, Excuse me. Is there anything else you'd like to, are there any other stories that come to mind from your wartime experiences? Oh, hmm. Well, uh, w one thing was, was uh, a little unusual, and that is the way we, uh, uh, we formed a crew. You weren't given a bomb aimer and a navigator or whatever. You, <clears throat> at the time, you, you started flying heavy aircraft, which needed a, a, a crew of six initially. Well, you started approaching people in the in the officers' mess who you th thought might be good. I've, there was an Australian uh, wireless operator that I got along with very well, and I asked, "Would he like to join with me?" Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, I I found a navigator that way uh, who had actually been in France and had been evacuated uh, uh, through the Dunkirk business. But um, but the, but. The rest of the crew, uh, the, the gunners and the the bomb aimer and so on, um, we were <coughs> sort of ushered into a, a large uh, hangar where there were all these <coughs> unassigned uh, of sergeants uh, wandering around. The gunners were mostly in pairs. They paired up because the, the rear gunner had to be small to get into the turret. The mid hour part kind of like could, could be any size, so they would be a, a Mutt and Jeff pair. And, and you sort of wandered around and you thought, well, that guy looks interesting, and you chat him up a bit, and would you like to join my crew? It was so casual, and without any knowledge of these people um, beforehand, uh, that it was, it was quite remarkable how we formed a, a really fine bond and, uh, a, you know, a strong feeling of, of uh, interdependence, really. Uh, I, I'm sure that probably happened to every pilot. Every pilot thinks he's got the best crew in the world, you know. Uh, but uh, that was, I thought, uh, uh, it seemed to work, but it was such a haphazard uh, way of, of doing things. Nothing like the personal touch, though. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Amazing. Now, do you want to say a few words about 
where we are at now, the Museum of World War II Boston, we are actually in the room known as the Battle of Britain room. Well, of course, uh, I did not participate personally in the Battle of Britain, but I had the greatest respect for those, those who did. Um, I see a, a, a pilot here who's a flight lieutenant, apparently, uh, with a very scruffy looking uniform. I'm not sure, I, but um, I think he needs cleaning up a bit, but <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Basically, I've been, uh, I have visited here a number of times, and I've always been impressed by the remarkable collection of stuff. And I'm not a bit surprised that it's a world leader in uh, its particular uh, area of uh, memorabilia, if you will. And uh, uh, <coughs> I've um, brought members of my family here and, and colleagues and where, we, where we're staying and so on. I always enjoy coming here. It's, it's, uh, and I always see something new. We are at the Museum of World War II in Boston, and we're here with Derek Till, who flew in the RAF during World War II, and he's going to show us the blind instrument panel. Mr. Till. Well, this uh, pa panel of six instruments we, gives you your airspeed, your attitude, your altitude, and other information is an absolute key, it certainly was during World War II, for precision flying when the weather was bad or at night or whatever. And the, the interesting thing about it is it was common to all the aircraft. It was common to the smallest trainer and to the Lancaster. Never mind what was going on around it, this panel was always in sight and you, you knew when you went into a different plane that you'd never flown before, you'd feel comforted by the fact that there's the old flying panel right there. We are at the Museum of World War II in Boston, and we're here with Derek Till, who flew in the RAF during World War II, and he's going to talk about escape kits. Mr. Till. Uh, after uh, um, the uh, br fairly lengthy breathing, uh, breathing section that, uh, that we had, uh, we'd then repair to a place where we would draw our stores of one sort and another, including parachutes and so on. But one of the things we would get was called an escape kit. And in it there were a number of things. Some of them were personal and assigned to us. Um, and, but here's one. This is a little tiny compass which you could uh, put in any of your mm -hmm. pockets or seams or hide it wherever you thought it might not be spotted by the uh, mm -hmm. German authorities if you were, if you were um, uh, parachuted down and uh, could try to make your way back through, through friendly territory. Another thing that... Uh, well, the, the, was built into your uniform actually. In, the, in those days, the trousers were, were uh, uh, fastened with, uh, with fly buttons, of course, and these were metal buttons on the uh, standard uh, issue stuff. But two of them were made in such a way that one had a little point on it and the other one fitted over that and could, could turn. And it also had on it two... Um, marks with fluorescent paint and it, it, it was magnetized so that you you took your fly buttons and you put one on top of the other and you had a very very rudimentary compass but it was a rather clever idea um, another thing that you had was um, uh, the, uh, the, the, these these three pictures are of me in uh, in, in an ordinary uh, <coughs> civilian clothing um, with a, a, a day's uh, growth of beard and so on. And uh, they were, were printed on paper which had been smuggled out of Germany so that they were, they were as authentic. And the idea was that if you parachuted down and could contact the local uh, resistance people, uh, they, they, they could use these photographs in order to make uh, documents to prove your proper identity and so on. 
and uh, so the the uh, uh, in the event that you did parachute down, there were at least some things you could you could cling on to with a hope that they might be helpful to you. We are at the Museum of World War II in Boston, and we're here with Derek Till, who flew in the RAF during World War II, and he's going to show us the blind instrument panel. Mr. Till. Well, this uh, pa panel of six instruments gives you your airspeed, your attitude, your altitude, and other information. It is an absolute key. It certainly was during uh, uh, World War II for uh, precision flying when the weather was bad or at night or whatever. And the, the interesting thing about it is it was common to all the aircraft. It was common to the smallest trainer and to the Lancaster. Never mind what was going on around it. This panel was always in sight. And you, you knew when you went into a different plane that you'd never flown before, you'd feel comforted by the fact that there's the old flying panel right there. We are at the Museum of World War II in Boston, and we're here with Derek Till, who flew in the RAF during World War II, and he's going to talk about escape kits. Mr. Till. Uh, after uh, um, the uh, br fairly lengthy briefing, uh, briefing section that, uh, that we had, uh, we then repair to a place where we would draw uh, stores of one sort and another, including parachutes and so on. But one of the things we would get was called an escape kit. And in it there were a number of things. Some of them were personal and assigned to us. Um, and, but here's one. This is a little tiny compass which you could uh, put in any of your mm -hmm. pockets or seams or hide it wherever you thought. It might not be spotted by the uh, mm -hmm. German authorities if you were, if you you. were um, uh, parachuted down and uh, could try to make your way back through, through friendly territory. Another thing that uh, was built into your uniform, actually, in, the, in those days, trousers were, were uh, uh, fastened with, uh, with fly buttons, of course, and these were metal buttons on the uh, standard uh, issue stuff. But two of them were made in such a way that one had a little point on it and the other one fitted over that and could, could turn. And it also had on it two um, marks with fluorescent paint. And it, it, it was magnetized so that you, you took your fly buttons and you put one on top of the other, and you had a very, very rudimentary compass. But it was a rather clever idea. Um, another thing that you had was um, uh, the, uh, the, these, these three pictures are of me in, uh, in, in an ordinary uh, <coughs> civilian clothing um, with a, a, a day's uh, growth of beard and so on. And uh, they were, were printed on paper, which had been smuggled out of Germany, so that they were, they were as authentic. And the idea was that if you parachuted down and could contact the local uh, resistance people, uh, they, they, they could use these photographs in order to make uh, documents to prove your proper identity and so on. And uh, so the... the uh, 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 in the event that you did parachute down, there were at least some things you could, you could cling on to with a hope that they might be helpful to you.